Hi everyone, my name is Wojciech Mowetski and it gives me great pleasure to be able to present a paper here at the Eagle on behalf of my team. That is Małgorzata Dobrowolska, Matthew Schneider Meyerson, Jagadish Thacker, Aina Lilia Pedersen, and Will Buckingham. Our topic for today is the impact of dystopian and utopian climate fiction on emotions and attitudes toward climate action, evidence from India and the US. Let me begin by saying a word on how climate fiction, or cli-fi as it is sometimes called, is understood in the present paper. And it is understood very broadly as any kind of fiction that focuses on or thematizes climate change. Be it a short story, such as Paolo Bacigalupi's famous piece, The Tamarous Hunter, or a novel, such as Kim, Kim Stanley Robinson's 50 Degrees Below. Now, it should be noted here that there are some debates as to whether cli-fi is a separate literary genre or not, but these are not relevant to the aims of this paper. But what is definitely relevant here is that as the world is getting warmer, climate fiction is becoming one of the hottest literary trends, and I'm definitely not exaggerating. Just take the fact that novels such as Richard Powers' The Overstory, Tim Stanley Robinson's The Ministry for the Future, or Barbara Kingsolver's White Behavior, are achieving bestseller status internationally and win prestigious prizes. The Overstory, for instance, won the Pulitzer Prize back in 2019. Such novels are also being widely discussed by journalists, critics, scholars, and even policymakers. Some of them claim that cli-fi is not only fascinating and topically relevant, but could even save the world. Here you see an example from The Guardian, but such claims are made in dozens, if not hundreds, of publications, in newspapers, magazines, and scholarly journals alike. The underlying theory behind the claims made by such publications is that climate change cannot be addressed without influence in the attitudes, beliefs, and behavior of the public, that the ordinary means of communication are insufficient to achieve that goal, and that cli-fi is a viable alternative through its creative potential and power. However, thus far, the empirical evidence on the impact of climate fiction is scarce and limited in its perspective. So first of all, that empirical evidence that not, does not sufficiently discern between the different kinds of climate fiction that have emerged in recent years. Its two most important subgenres, utopian and dystopian cli-fi in particular. And dystopian cli-fi is a kind of cli-fi that focuses on catastrophic visions of the climate future, where climate change leads to large-scale disasters that significantly affect various populations of people and other living organisms, or even to a total collapse of civilization and massive devastation of the planet's biosphere as a whole. And when it comes to utopian cli-fi, it focuses on positive visions of the on positive visions of the climate future. Excuse me, presenting scenarios in which humanity manages to significantly decrease, stop, or even revert climate change, thereby averting a global climate catastrophe, and in some cases introducing new, more progressive and sustainable forms of economy, industry, transport, politics, and uh, government. A second important of the current empirical research on climate fiction is that it fail, it does not sufficiently take into account the emotional impact of cli-fi. Uh, in particular, it fails to investigate that impact in light, in light of the recent booming research on eco-emotions in environmental communication and psychology. Moreover, it relies, that kind of research relies mainly on samples from Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, or weird countries, and does not sufficiently take into account that in each national population, one can distinguish between different types of climate audiences, which respond differently to different kinds of communication. For example, the alarmed, concerned, cautious, disengaged, doubtful, and dismissive, which are six kinds of uh, climate audiences that have been discerned in the U.S. Now, the present study seeks to address these limitations by experimentally comparing uh, the effects of utopian cli-fi, dystopian cli-fi, and a combination of both on emotions and attitudes toward climate action 
among Indian and US readers, representing two of the currently largest climate audiences, which are commonly labeled as the alarm and uh, concern. Now, the reason why we chose to focus on dystopian and utopian sci-fi in our study is not only the fact that these two constitute what are most likely the most popular forms of sci-fi, but also because there is an important debate unfolding in the scholarly literature and the media as well about dystopian and utopian climate communications, including those that belong to sci-fi. The debate is stimulated by the fact that dystopian climate narratives appear to be one of the most common strategies used by organizations, media outlets, activists, and artists to stimulate climate action. Be they movies such as The Day After Tomorrow, performances such as those staged by Extinction Rebellion, an example here on the right, or journalistic stories. These narratives typically convey the message that if climate change proceeds on its current trajectory, its consequences will mean the end of life as we know it in biological, demographic, political, economic, and virtually all other significant terms. The underlying idea here seems to be that the public needs to be somehow shocked into climate action, as no milder form of persuasion will suffice to corrode the deeply ingrained habits preventing it from acting. As Greta Thunberg put it in her famous Davos speech, I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic and act as if the house was on fire. However, it has also been argued that the use of such fear appeals, rather than stimulating climate action and pro-environmental behavior, is more likely to result in or exacerbate climate-related mental health problems, such as climate anxiety, climate helplessness, or climate depression. That would be a very worrying outcome indeed. Climate anxiety, for example, is a serious condition that can discourage one from climate action and considerably lower one's quality of life, and it rapidly spreads around the globe, particularly among younger generations. It is argued that a viable alternative might be utopian climate narratives, showing people a desired climate outcome without at the same time inducing fear responses. And here's an interview with Kim Stanley Robinson for the Time magazine, whose title nicely summarizes the idea here. You need to use hope like a club to beat your opponent. However, while utopian climate narratives look like a very good alternative, research on the so-called extended parallel process model in climate communication suggests that an even more optimal means of climate communication might be combining utopian and dystopian themes. This is because, as implied by EPPM, quote, climate activity is activated by, unquote, a combination of both hope and fear. Now, to be more exact, the model looks as follows. So first, people are exposed to a message urging them to take action on climate change to avoid climate threat. This leads to threat appraisal, that is, people judge the severity of the threat and their susceptibility to it. If the threat is judged to be low, then the message is rejected and there's no behavior change. If the threat is judged to be high, then this gives rise to fear, and fear leads to efficacy appraisal. That is, people judge, resp judge response efficacy or the effectiveness of the recommended behavior to avoid the threat and self-efficacy or whether they're able to perform the recommended behavior. If that efficacy is judged to be low, then the message is rejected and again we have no behavior change. If the efficacy is judged to be high, then this gives rise to hope and the message is accepted and this leads to behavior change. At least this is what is suggested by the model. Now, it is in line with this model that we decided to include in our comparison not only dystopian and utopian sci-fi, but also a combination of both, which might be expected to stimulate both fear, for example, through portrayals of climate disasters, and hope, for example, through portrayals of successful attempts to mitigate climate change. Our hypotheses in the study were as follows. First, reading dystopian sci-fi will make the participants more likely to experience fear than reading either utopian sci-fi, 
a combination of both these kinds of cli-fi for a controlled task. Two, reading utopian cli-fi will make the participants more likely to experience hope than reading either dystopian cli-fi, a combination of both these kinds of cli-fi, or a control text. And three, reading a combination of dystopian and utopian cli-fi will make the participants more likely to experience hope than reading dystopian cli-fi. Then four, reading a combination of dystopian and utopian cli-fi will make the participants more likely to experience hope than reading dystopian cli-fi. Five, reading a combination of dystopian and utopian cli-fi will make the participants more willing to take action on climate change than reading either utopian cli-fi, dystopian cli-fi, or a controlled tax. And six, the effects postulated in hypothesis five, five, I'm sorry, will be mediated by hope and fear. Now on to our method. Our experimental texts were excerpts from one of the most famous and popular cli-fi novels of recent years, The Ministry for the Future, by one of the most recognized living cli-fi authors, Kim Stanley Robbins. The book has been widely discussed by literary critics, environmental humanists, environmental journalists, and activists and policymakers, with Barack Obama, for example, listing it as, as one of his favorite books of 2020. The novel tells the story of a fictional United Nations unit, the titular Ministry for the Future, established in 2025 to protect the rights of the future generations and mainly concerned with tackling climate change. Now, our dystopian cli-fi stimulus was the first chapter of that novel, which depicts an episode from a heat wave killing millions of people in India. Our utopian stimulus was a text combining excerpts from various chapters of the book describing successful efforts of India to tackle climate change, including both top-bottom initiatives such as geoengineering and bottom-up initiatives such as the rise of new political movements and agricultural uh, communities. The third experimental stimulus, uh, hereafter referred to as the compound text, consistent of, consisted of the two previous stimuli combined. And our control text was an excerpt from a different novel by Kim Stanley Robinson that did not concern climate change in either explicit or implicit way. It should be noted here that the experiment demanded making some small edits to those texts. But in order to prove the ecological validity of these manipulations, they were made either by or in assistance with a professional writer, Will Buckingham, who is also a philosopher of literature, and our team member. Uh, the data from our study, uh, the data in our study came from an online survey administered and collected by the marketing com company Sino International, hired specifically for that purpose. The sample was drawn from the adult population in India and USA, representing two types of climate audiences, the alarm and the concern. In choosing participants from both a weird and non-weird country, we strove to address not only the cultural limitation of much of the empirical study of cli-fi and literature in general, which typically focuses on weird samples, but also the fact that climate change typically affects non-weird countries to a greater extent. USA and India were chosen in particular not only because they represent two of the biggest and most influential weird and non-weird countries respectively, but also because the novel from which our stimuli came was written by a U.S. author from a U.S. specific cultural perspective, but concerned to a large extent India. Now, the two main reasons behind choosing participants recruiting from the alarmed and concerned are that these are both the two largest climate audiences across numerous national populations, and that while they show considerable concern about climate change and interest in climate messages, hence and hence are more likely to read cli-fi than other audiences, their levels of engagement in climate actions uh, in climate action are generally low, rendering them a vital target target of climate persuasion. Our chosen instrument for qualifying the participants as concerned or alarmed was the so-called Six Americas sh Short Survey developed by the Yale Program of Climate Change Communication. That instrument is commonly used to segment respondents into six different types of climate audiences based on their level of climate concern, 
from the concern to the from the concern to the dismissal. I'm sorry. The instrument consisted of four items. For example, how important is the issue of global warming to you personally? From five, extremely important, to one, not at all important. In order to test the impact of the stimuli on the participants' fear and hope, we asked them to record how strongly did you feel each of the following emotions when reading the text on a scale from one to five. The item was inspired by the widely used PANAS X scale and consistent with instruments measuring risk or climate risk related emotions, such as, for example, the Berlin Emotional Responses to Risk Instrument. Finally, a measure of climate activism was adopted from a study by the Yale Program on Climate Communication, and that measure consisted of two questions. First, uh, how likely would you be to do each of the following things if a person you liked and respected asked you to do, asked you to, I'm sorry, donate money to an organization working on global warming, volunteer your time to an organization working on global warming, and so on. Second, the second item was how willing or unwilling would you be to join a campaign to convince elected officials to take action to reduce global warming? And the options were from one, I definitely would not do it, to five, I am participating in a campaign, campaign like this now. Now on to our procedure. So participants were randomly assigned to three experimental groups and a control group and asked to read their respective text, the utopian, dystopian, compound, and control excerpts. Then they were asked to fill in a questionnaire comprising the items described above, as well as a set of demographic items, including concerning their gender, age, education, and others. Finally, they were thanked for their participation and the brief. Now let's see what the results were. To test hypothesis one, that reading dystopian cli-fi would elicit more fear than reading either utopian cli-fi, the combination of both, or the compound text, or the control text, we conducted an ANOVA with planned contrast, where text was the independent variable and fear was a dependent variable. We performed the analysis separately within the US and Indian sample. In both samples, there was a significant main effect of text on of fear. Confirming hypothesis one, both Indian and US participants who read the dystopian text reported being more afraid compared to uh, those who read the utopian text, those who read the compound text, and those who read the control text. When it comes to hypothesis two, in both samples there was also a significant main effect of text on hope. And in both samples, the plant contrast revealed that participants who read the utopian text reported being more hopeful compared to those who read the dystopian text and the control text. However, while in the US sample, the participants who read the utopian text reported feeling more hopeful than those having read the compound text, there was no significant difference in this regard between the two groups in the Indian sample. Hypothesis two was therefore fully confirmed only for the US sample and only partially confirmed for the Indian sample. When it comes to hypotheses uh, three and four, in the US sample, participants who read the compound text did not report fearing more, feeling, I'm sorry, more hopeful than those who read the dystopian text. However, in the Indian sample, the reverse was true with participants reading the compound text reporting more hope than those in the dystopian condition. Hypothesis three was therefore confirmed only for the Indian sample. And confirming hypothesis four, in both samples, the results showed that participants who read the compound text versus the positive text reported being more afraid. Now onto hypothesis five. In neither sample did the participants reading the compound text reported more willingness to take action on climate change than those reading either utopian cli-fi, dystopian cli-fi, or a control text, thereby fully disconfirming hypothesis five. There was also no significant impact of the other two experimental texts on climate action. Now, if you remember hypothesis six was that the effect uh, postulated in hypothesis five would be 
mediated by hope and fear. And while there was no direct effect of the compound tax on willingness to take climate action, it is consistent with statistical theory that there might still have been an indirect effect of the tax mediated by hope and fear. Since only in the Indian sample did the compound tax exhibit an impact on fear and hope consistent with the model behind hypothesis 6, we conducted analyses only for that sample. In, uh, to be more exact, we performed a, a multi-categorical parallel mediation analysis using process where X was text type, uh, M1 was fear, and M2 was hope, and the Y was willingness to take climate action. The analyses revealed that there was no significant indirect effect of the compound tax versus the dystopian or utopian tax on climate action through hope and fear. However, there was a significant mediation effect for the compound tax when it was compared to the control tax. As you can see from the figure in the next slide, the participants who read the control tax had lower scores of, uh, on both hope and fear compared to the compound, and this in turn was related to the willingness to take action on climate change, negatively for feeling afraid, and positively for hope. The total indirect effect indicated that those who read the compound tax were slightly higher in their intention to act on climate as a result of the tax manipulation on the mediators and subsequently willingness to take climate action. And here's the, here's the graph that I mentioned. Now, what do these results mean, actually? Our results reveal that while the tax combining utopian and dystopian climate fiction was efficient at stimulating both hope and fear, it did not have any direct effect on willingness to engage in climate action, while its indirect effect on that variable through hope and fear was very small. The tax was also not more efficient at stimulating willingness to engage in climate action than either the dystopian or utopian tax, which themselves had no direct effect on climate action whatsoever. Now, these results provide only limited support to the extended parallel process, process model in climate communication and cast doubt on the overall persuasiveness of CLIFI regarding climate action, especially that the text we use came from a novel that is considered highly persuasive and a masterpiece of the genre, and that the lack of direct effects was observed, was observed cross-culturally in samples from two wildly different, widely different populations. However, the conclusions presented above should be approached approach with caution, given the limitations of the present study. First then, our results are limited to two specific types of climate audiences, the concern and the alarm. The impact of CLIFI on climate action might be different for other types of audiences. Perhaps the concern and the alarmed are too concerned and alarmed about climate change for them to be convinced to act by messages of an ostensibly artistic character that depict fictional, fictional events. Perhaps they need instead messages that are decisively non-fictional and bear the authority of official institutions. It might also be the case that, as indicated by available data, being generally more accustomed to climate ma messages than the other types of climate audiences, the concerned and alarmed are also less susceptible to such messages' persuasive intentions. The text we used pose some problems too. To begin with, while the most popular and famous examples of cli-fi are novels, we used shorter texts in our study due to practical reasons that caused the empirical study of literature to generally avoid using whole novels in experiments. It is not precluded that immersing oneself in a cli-fi novel, especially one as big as the Ministry for the Future, which is almost 600 pages long, and exposes the reader to numerous dystopian and utopian themes along the way has a greater impact on climate action than any short story could ever have. Moreover, the short texts we use were not originally written that way, but rather as parts of a larger whole. And despite our best efforts to make them readable as autonomous texts, their artificial character might have diminished their persuasiveness. Finally, any difference or lack of difference between the compound tax and the remaining tax might have been confounded by its being twice as long. To remind you, the dystopian tax was around 
5,000 words, the utopian text around 6,000 words, while the compound text was 11,000 words long. Reading an 11,000 word text in the conditions of an online study might have been might have been too taxing for most of our participants, limiting the text persuasiveness. Or on the contrary, the longer time spent with the compound text might have made it easier for the participants to get immersed in it, thereby increasing its persuasiveness. And finally, we measure the immediate effects of a single exposure. While there's evidence that the impact of fiction may be greater a week or more after exposure, and while most claims about the persuasiveness of Cli-Fi assume an exposure to Cli-Fi that is systematic and extended over time. This limitation of our study, uh, this, these limitations of our study are also due to practical reasons having to do with the cost of conducting longitudinal experiments with large cross-cultural samples. However, at least some of these limitations will be remedied thanks to the studies planned as part of the grant project I'm honored to lead, titled Climate Fiction as Environmental Communication, awarded by the National Science Center Poland, which also co-funds the current study. But that is, of course, something for the future. For now, I would like to thank you all for your attention and also use this occasion to thank my wonderful team. That is, again, Matthew Schneider Mayerson, Jagger Thacker, Małgorzata Dobrowolska, I know Lilia Pedersen and Will Buckingham. So thanks again. Needless to say, I look forward to your questions and 